Hey everyone, this is Barricade Kindo. Welcome to Stat Courses. In a prior lesson, I have given an intuitive introduction to the probability density function of a univariate continuous random variable. For a continuous random variable, the probability density function at a specific point can be thought of as the relative likelihood of observing values in a very small interval containing that specific point. Okay, we used an example starting with the construction of a histogram of home sale prices data. Then we added constraints to the bar heights of the histogram so that the area covered by the histogram adds up to one. This gave us what we called density-based histogram. As we decreased the bin interval length of the histogram, we were able to approximate the probability density function of home sale prices. We defined we formally defined what probability density function of a univariate random variable is and what conditions it must satisfy. All right. I encourage you to review that lesson. I will put a link to the video lesson also in this, in this video's notes section. In this lesson, we will take a similar approach for an intuitive understanding of the joint probability density function of two continuous random variables. I will then give formal definitions of the joint probability density function of a multivariate random vector. All right, let's consider two random variables jointly. The first random variable is the sale price of a residential home in US dollars. And the second random variable is the lot area and square feet on which the home is built on. Now, the question is, how do these two continuous variables behave jointly? All right. Suppose sale price of a residential home is denoted by the random variable capital X or upper X and lot area of the property on which the home resides is denoted by the random variable upper Y. How is this bivariate vector X comma Y uppercase x comma uppercase y, how is that bivariate vector distributed? That is the question we seek to answer in this video lesson. You may hypothesize that larger lot area may warrant higher sale price. You may also wonder if, you know, smaller lot areas could have smaller and less expensive homes built on them, thus having lower sale prices. As a uh, as a good statistician or data-based uh, decision maker you are, you go ahead and collect data to understand sale price and lot area joint dynamics. We visually see by creating a scatter plot of sale prices and dollars versus lot area and square feet that there is some positive correlation of the two random variables. You also notice from the scatter plot that some regions on the scatter plot are sparsely populated compared to other regions on the scatter plot. What does that mean? It means you are more likely to observe residential homes, for example, uh, in region A, enclosed in red, compared to region B, enclosed in black. Both regions, A and B, cover equal area on the coordinate plane lot area and square feet versus sale prices in US dollars. In fact, the sample proportion of homes that fall in region A is higher than that of homes that fall in region B. Region A has a sample proportion of 0.0466. The sample proportion of homes that fall in region B is 0.00348. Again, uh, these two regions have similar area on the coordinate plane. Region A in red contains home sale prices between $150,000 and $175,000, a range of $25,000. It contains homes with lot areas between $8,000 and $10,000. That is a lot area length of 2,000 square feet. $25,000 sales sale prices range and $2,000, I'm sorry, 2,000 square feet lot area length. Region B, bounded in black, contains home, homes with sale prices between $75,000 and 
again, $25,000 length of home prices, and lot areas between 15,000 and 17,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet range. Both regions cover price intervals of length $25,000 and lot area interval lengths of 2,000 square feet. But they have two different sample proportions. They have different densities. One of the areas is densely populated than the other one. Perhaps a way to visualize the joint distribution of home sale prices and lot areas is by creating a three-dimensional plot. All right. For example, for each rectangular partition spanning a range of $25,000 sale prices and 2,000 square feet of lot area, you could add a third dimension representing the sample proportion, thus creating a, a bunch of rectangular prisms that form a three-dimensional histogram, right? To find the volume of one of these three-dimensional prisms, you take the area of the two-dimensional region obtained by partitioning the X and Y plane, and then multiply that area by the height of the three-dimensional bar or the three-dimensional prism. For now, we set the height to equal the sample proportion of homes that satisfy the lot area and sale price partition or region on which the prism stands on. Let me ask you a question. What is the overall volume covered by these, uh, by this three-dimensional histogram? Okay. If we were to assume the partitioning of the X comma Y plane or the horizontal plane is done so that each partition has an equal area, we can calculate the overall volume covered by the three-dimensional histogram as the sum of the volumes of each of the rectangular prisms that make up the, the three-dimensional histogram. And that is equal to the area of the first partition of the XY plane times the sample proportion of data in that first region plus the area of the second partition of the XY plane, the second region of the XY plane, times the sample proportion of homes that fall in that second region and continuing to add the volume contributions of all the rectangular prisms including the last one which could be the area of the last partition of the xy plane times the sample proportion in that region and if you sum that up you get the total volume covered by the three-dimensional histogram now uh, since the areas uh, are set to be equal uh, by our construction of the histogram now with that i can take the area of a single partition or the single region as a common multiplier so that I am left with, in this parentheses, I am left with the sum of all sample proportions. Okay, we know that the sum of all the sample proportions equals one. And therefore, the overall volume covered by the histogram equals the area of one of the partitions times one. So that's the area of one of the partitions. Uh, feel free to pause the video to think through what we just said. Now, let's say I wanna make sure the overall volume covered by the three-dimensional histogram is equal to one. If I want to do that, I will need to divide, to divide each of the heights of the prisms by the area of the two-dimensional region they are standing on. If I do that, then the height of the rectangular prisms represents what we call a density, a joint density in this case. And it tells us how densely populated each rectangular region is relative to another rectangular region with an equal area. Okay, what happens as we decrease the area of these rectangular regions? As we decrease the areas of these rectangular regions, we can interpret the height of the single rectangular prism, which becomes thinner and thinner, as the relative likelihood of observing a value close to the two-dimensional point x, little x, comma, little y that is included in the region that this uh, thin rectangular prism is standing on. That relative likelihood is what we call the joint density. And with larger and larger sample data, and very, very small region on the horizontal plane, you can imagine the height of the density and that very small area around that point to have a corresponding density 
expressed by a three-dimensional continuous function. That function would take realizations little x comma little y of the joint random vector represented by upper x and upper letter y, that jointly, x comma y. And that function, which outputs a density value f of x comma y, is the probability density function, which represents the relative likelihood of observing values around the point little x comma little y. Let's do something we have done for the univariate case. In the one random variable case, we had the area under the probability density function being equal to 1. And this bivariate, that is two variable case, we have the volume, volume instead of area, the volume under the joint probability density function surface, now instead of a line representing the PDF or the probability density function, we have a surface a three-dimensional surface representing it. And the volume under that three-dimensional surface equals one. Again, calculus gives us a great way to calculate volume under a surface described by a function, a continuous function, and that is using integrals. The integral, double integral in this case, because we have two uh, random variables, x and y, we are looking at jointly. The double integral with respect to both variables of the joint probability function f dx dy equals 1. And in the one ra random variable case, if we have one random variable x, uh, an, an analogous uh, uh, integral we have seen is the area under the curve, the integral of f of x dx being equal to 1. Okay? Now, what are the requirements a joint probability density function, a bivariate joint probability density function must satisfy? One of the requirements is the double integral, the multivariate integral for all values and uh, and the support of x comma y dx dy must equal one. Okay, that's one of the properties a a joint bivariate random vector must satisfy. Another property of the joint probability density function is that it is non-negative. It is greater than or equal to zero. You would expect a function that is intuitively interpreted as the relative likelihood to be at least equal to zero. So therefore, the joint probability density function must take a value greater than or equal to zero. In fact, it takes values strictly greater than zero in the region, let's say, in the region S, the script S, which denotes the support of the random vector or the joint random vector. That is, the set of all possible values of the joint random vector, capital X, comma, capital Y, for which the probability density function is greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, is called the support S of the random vector. We can Now, we can now further extend these ideas to joint probability density function of more than two random variables. Suppose we have an n-dimensional random vector, symbolically, X, com x subscript 1, comma, x subscript 2, dot, 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 x subscript n. All of them are in capital letters because they are random variables. The multivariate joint probability density function is denoted by f of x1, comma, x2, comma, dot, 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 xn, where little x's are realizations or observed values of the random vector x1, comma, 2, comma, x1, comma, x2, comma, dot 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 x n. Now this multivariate joint probability density function must integrate to one. That is the multivariate integral with respect to all of the individual components of the random vector must equal one. All right. And finally, the multivariate probability density function must take values greater than or equal to zero. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to cover today. And that concludes our lesson. Feel free to share this with uh, your friends or anyone you think may be interested in such topics. Thanks for your attention.